Thank you, and thank you for coming out um, today. Um, as was mentioned, I am a social and personality psychologist, and so it's through that lens that I study the experience of meaning in life. I'll be presenting uh, the first sort of data-heavy talk of the day, um, so buckle up. <laughs> um, so the work I'm gonna tell you about today uh, doesn't really speak to features of the most meaningful lives or uh, contribute to any sort of objective description of what a meaningful life should be. Instead, today I'm gonna to tell you about research I've been doing, focusing on subjective reports of meaning and arguing that we can learn a lot by looking at these experiences of meaning in everyday people sort of nestled in their regular lives. So many of us are in this room today we've, because we've spent just excessive amounts of time thinking about meaning in life. And typically when we think about personal meaning, we focus on questions, uh, these excessively existential questions like, why am I here? And what is the point of my existence? And in thinking of these big, broad questions, we come to paint meaning as this really grandiose and profound experience. It's sort of the ultimate um, sort of sense of your place in the world. And in this grandiosity, we make some assumptions about what the experience of meaning in life is like. Specifically, we often think of meaning as something that has to be the result of this really effortful process and that it's very difficult to attain. We have to go through a lot of work to find our meaning. So this is embedded in all sorts of uh, sort of theories of meaning. Um, so existentialism uh, is built on this notion that meaning is something that we really have to effortfully lay over this reality of the world as this utterly meaningless place. We have to do it. Similarly, modern psychological theories of meaning in life also focus on this human ability that we have to construct and impose meaning on our world. These processes that we've found that humans are able to engage in to reinstate meaning when it's threatened or to find meaning um, from sort of nothing. But the question I'm interested in is whether the sense of meaning always requires this effortful approach. So I am an empiricist, so I thought I might see what sort of regular people think about this question. So I asked lay participants uh, several questions about their views about meaning in life. They tended to disagree that meaning in life is something that's experienced without effort. And they agreed that living a meaningful life is hard work. So it seems that people are thinking that um, sort of meaning must be experienced with some effort, that we have to actively engage in this effortful process to actively forge a meaningful existence. These beliefs about meaning uh, seem com common across different cultures as well. My colleagues and I asked participants in uh, eight different countries uh, whether they thought living a meaningful life is hard work. Our participants in Singapore didn't necessarily agree with this statement, but it turns out they were an outlier uh, participants from Germany, Portugal, Korea, Angola, Norway, Japan, and particularly in the United States, reported that they thought that living a meaningful life took hard work. So these ideas about meaning as something that takes this effort, it's something we impose on the world, seem to be really pervasive, even beyond folks in this room who think about it for a living. But this raises the question is whether everyday experiences of meaning in life actually require this effort. We think meaning requires this effort, but if we look at the experiences of everyday people, are they engaging in these effortful processes to find a sense of meaning in their lives? But before I get into this, I wanna take a step back and just provide you with the definition of meaning in life that I use. Uh, Crystal did a great job sort of laying the groundwork for the rest of the conference and, and giving you our psychological perspective of meaning in life. And I will double down on basically exactly what she said. So meaning in life is one of those constructs that does seem a bit ineffable. It's kind of hard to describe. But we have developed definitions of meaning uh, based on the empirical evidence we have available. Um, this is one um, from a paper from Josh Hicks, who you'll hear from later in the conference, suggesting that lives may be experienced as meaningful when they're felt to have a significance beyond the trivial or momentary, to have purpose, 
or to have a coherence that transcends chaos. So once again, this definition is highlighting that the subjective feeling state of meaning is comprised of these three central building blocks. The first being significance, or feeling like we matter to others, that we're making an impact in the world, as Frank told us about, um, that we're going to leave a lasting legacy that will sort of outlive us. The second is purpose, which refers to engagement in goal-directed pursuits. And the third is this idea of coherence, our ability to make sense of the world and to understand our place in it. So my work in examining the meaning in everyday life has really focused on this third aspect of meaning, that of coherence. This refers to the degree to which stimuli and events make sense and really has to do with how we understand the world and our place in it. So definitions of meaning in life have long included coherence. Um, it's always been known sort of that it's important that we need to make sense of our place in the world and sort of these grand questions. But the question I wanted to ask was whether manipulating the coherence in a person's immediate external environment actually influences feelings of meaning in life. Not through any sort of effortful process that the individual actively engages in to create meaning, but just simply as a result of being faced with a situation that already makes inherent sense. So in one of my early tests of this question, I experimentally manipulated coherence um, by manipulating the presence of pattern in stimuli that I showed to participants. So in these first studies I'll tell you about, I showed participants images of trees. Uh, specifically, I showed them uh, images of four trees depicting each of the four seasons. So participants saw these trees. Some of my participants saw these stimuli presented one at a time in a completely random order generated by the computer. My other participants saw these same stimuli, but arranged in repeating cycles over the course of the study. So in one condition, this fit with the calendar year, so they would see a, a, picture, of spring, a picture of a tree in spring, summer, fall, winter, and then a different picture of a tree in spring, summer, fall, winter, over and over. So this is based on a pattern they've known for their whole lives. So in order to determine whether any effects I might see are based on sort of these long-held patterns or simply a sort of one-shot experience of coherence, I also included a third condition where participants saw these trees in a repeating pattern, but this didn't fit with the calendar year. So I simply just shuffled around the seasons, but they still saw these in patterns. So a tree of spring winter, summer, fall, spring, winter, summer, fall. So this is a novel pattern just within the context of this study. After viewing these images and they rated them on some dimensions like their color quality or things like that that don't really matter to the study, they then rated their meaning in life and implicit and explicit affect. And what we found was that participants who viewed these images in a patterned order with this underlying coherence to them rated their lives as more meaningful compared to participants who saw those very same stimuli without that coherent pattern. And this held controlling for affect as well. So it seems that these manipulations of uh, regularities and coherence in a person's environment can cause them to feel in the moment that their lives are more meaningful without this degree of effort. I found similar effects of coherence on meaning in life across a host of other studies as well, using other manipulations. I'll just tell you about a few here today. Uh, the first thing I wanted to do was to bring this into a negative context. A lot of times that we're trying to make sense of our lives and the world, it's when things aren't going quite right. We know this from a lot of Crystal Park's work, uh, looking at meaning making following trauma, all of these sort of meaning processes tend to be embedded in these negative situations. So I wanted to see if manipulating pattern in negative stimuli would lead to higher ratings of meaning in life compared to seeing these same negative stimuli um, without a pattern. So I used the same uh, procedures that I used in the previous trees study, except I swapped out the images of seasonal trees with uh, images taken from the International Effective Picture System database Specifically, I selected five images each 
that had been normed to elicit each of three distinct emotion categories. So participants saw five different pictures eliciting disgust, five of sadness, and five of fear. I once again used the same manipulation. Half of these participants saw these images in a completely random order. The other half saw them arranged in repeating patterns, this time based on their emotional content. And then they rated their meaning in life. And once again, we found that participants shown these images in the pattern order rated their lives as more meaningful compared to participants shown those same negative images in the random order. So it seems that there's something about this degree of coherence that is making them in the moment feel sort of a sense that things are making sense and this transfers to reports of personal meaning. I've also expanded my conceptualization of coherence in these studies uh, beyond patterns to include associations as well. Uh, a lot of times that we try to navigate our world and understand our world, we rely on associations to do so. And so uh, the, the task I used in this study was the remote associates task. So in this task, participants are shown uh, triads of words. Um, some of these triads are what researchers call coherent triads. Uh, and this is an example of one, manners, round, and tennis. In coherent triads, the three words aren't themselves related to one another, but they do share a fourth common associate. So here, if you think about the words manners, round, and tennis, they share the common associate of table. So research has shown that when participants are shown these coherent triads, they're able to sense whether or not they're a coherent triad even before they're able to identify what that fourth common associate is. And so what we did here was um, manipulated the stimuli that we showed participants. In one group of our participants in our coherent condition, they simply read 10 of these coherent word triads. Now, we didn't tell them to look for a fourth common associate or that something might be there. We simply said we were piloting these materials for an, another study and that we needed to know how long it took them to read the words. So they were to simply read the words and move to the next one. So they weren't actively finding the coherence in these studies, in these uh, triads. In our control condition, we showed participants the same 30 words but we jumbled them up so that they were presented in triads that didn't contain this fourth common associate. And once again, we found that participants who saw our coherent triads rated their lives as more meaningful compared to participants who saw these incoherent triads. So it seems that being exposed to these associations sort of raises this sense that something is going right and raises the sense that our lives have meaning. Lastly, I wanted to examine the effects of associations on meaning in life in a less sort of artificial context. Fortunately, our lives are driven by associations, so there's a lot to choose from when designing uh, studies around real life associations. One of the associations we use to navigate life is that we often execute certain behaviors at particular times of the day. And so I drew on this association in designing this next study in this study, participants completed a word find task. There were two different word find tasks that we used in this study. In half of these, participants were searching for words pertaining to the morning. So things like bagel and bacon and breakfast and sunrise and, and so on. The other half of my participants completed word finds that included words pertaining to the evening. Things like wine and steak and sunset and bedtime. We crossed this manipulation with another manipulation. That was the time of day that participants completed this task. Participants either completed this task in the morning before 10 a.m. or in the evening after 4 p.m., I believe. And what we expected was that completing a time congruent task would trigger these associations and would lead people to experience the report that their lives felt more meaningful at that time. And indeed, that's what we found. Participants who completed the morning word find in the morning, or the breakfast word find here, or the dinner word find in the evening, these outside bars rated their lives as more meaningful compared to participants who are completing this time incongruent task. 
So it seems that participants are able to sense that something fits here or in the other conditions that something isn't quite right here, and this is translating to their reports of feelings that their lives are meaningful. So together these studies suggest that simply by manipulating the features of a person's external environment, and particularly the coherence in that environment, can move around these feelings, these momentary feelings of meaning in life. Not because in these moments participants are actively creating meaning, but simply because they're extracting it from the external world that we are presenting them with. And so these studies suggest that our drive to understand the world is linked to the sense that life is meaningful. When the world is making sense, our lives feel more meaningful. And one way that our lives, I'll argue that luckily, the world is often quite easy to make sense of, at least locally. There are some big questions that are very difficult to make sense of, but when we're navigating our daily lives, we're not often running around in complete chaos. And one way that we make our lives less chaotic is by engaging in regular routines. Now, as Crystal mentioned before, it might seem that routines are the utter antithesis of a meaningful life. But to the extent that routines provide us with this sense of regularity and this base for understanding and making sense of, of the world and our place in it and who we are, we have to allow ourselves to ask the empirical question of are routines relevant for meaning in life? And so I did this. Uh, the first way that I tested this was uh, with a series of correlational studies. So I had participants complete meaning in life scales, and then I had them rate uh, this trait routinization scale. I was specifically interested in this, this subcomponent of the scale, which is the preference for having daily order and routine. This scale contains some pretty mundane items, things like, I do pretty much the same things every day. So when you sit there and ponder what a meaningful life is, this probably isn't something that you think about. But across three uh, fairly good-sized studies, we were finding a consistent positive correlation between meaning in life and the preference for having order and routine in one's life. Those participants who said they like to do basically the same things from day to day were the same participants who were rating their lives higher. This relationship was quite robust. Uh, we tried to control for basically everything we could think of, and nothing ever sort of made this relationship go away. So controlling for things like mindfulness, religiosity, affect, need satisfaction, boredom proneness, we're still seeing this positive relationship between this preference for routine and meaning in life. So next we wanted to see if this kind of moves beyond these trait correlations and see if we can measure whether participants engage in particular behaviors in routine ways might also relate to their meaning in life. So I wanted to pick a routine that I thought many of my participants might have, so I went to my own routines to draw on that, and I selected drinking coffee. So the first thing I asked participants is whether or not they were coffee drinkers. There were fewer coffee drinkers than I imagined. I guess I don't represent the whole world. <laughs> there we go. Um, but I did have a good number of regular coffee drinkers. And then what I did was ask participants to rate the degree to which they engage in this coffee drinking behavior in a stable, routine way. So I did so with two items. How often do you drink your coffee in the same place? So I go to the same coffee shop, or I drink my coffee at home, or sort of whatever's closest. And how often do you drink your coffee in the same way? You always have your coffee black, or you sort of walk up and look at the menu and see what season it is and whatever strikes you. And then, of course, we had participants rate their meaning in life. And we found this interaction effect um, between coffee drinking status and the routine stability of their coffee drinking behavior predicting meaning in life. So I'll break this down. The green line that's very flat are my non-coffee drinkers 
And I'm happy to see this flat line because these questions about the routine of how they drink their coffee are completely nonsensical to these people. They're no, they don't drink coffee. But what I'm most interested in is this red line. These are my participants who actually drink coffee. And what I found was that participants who did this particular behavior in a routine way also reported their lives as more meaningful. There was this positive correlation between not only thinking that you like this sense of order and routine, but actually organizing particular behaviors in your lives to follow these routine patterns. A rating their lives is more meaningful. But the question I'm particularly interested in here isn't these sort of individual um, differences and trends. What I really wanted to know was whether my meaning in life is, is higher when I'm engaging in a routine compared to those moments when I'm not engaging in a routine. This within-person question. When a person is engaging in a behavior that's a routine, do they rate their lives as feeling more meaningful at that time compared to other times when they're not engaged in a routine behavior? So to test this within-person question, I utilized what's called the experience sampling method. So in this method, I uh, recruited 85 undergraduates, and I bombarded them. I sent them six questionnaires on their cell phones for a full week, every day for a full week. So they were responding to up to this is 42 questionnaires. And so we're getting a lot of data about these participants in a lot of different situations. We had a pretty good response rate. 72% of the surveys I sent out were returned completed, which in this line of work is, is a pretty good response rate, so I was happy with that. So in each of these surveys, participants uh, answered a number of questions. First, I asked them to describe briefly what they were doing right at that moment. And then I had them rate the degree to which the thing they were doing right then was part of a routine they had. So I did so with items like the activity is do, I'm doing right now is part of a routine I have, my current activity is one I'd typically be doing at this time, and the activity I'm doing right now is one I've done this way before and will continue to do this way in the future. So really getting a sense of whether the thing that they're doing is part of a routine that they have. And then they rated their meaning in life um, with Mike Steger's meaning in life questionnaire. Um, we modified this to uh, end all of the items with a right now to really get at this sort of state sense that your life feels meaningful right now to be able to get these fluctuations within person across time. And then we had participants also rate their mood from very bad to very good. And the question we're wondering about here is whether participants were reporting higher meaning in life during those episodes in which they were engaged in something that was more routine. And that's exactly what we found in our hierarchical analyses. The degree to which a participant was engaging in something that was more routine for them was positively associated with concurrent reports of higher meaning in life. Now this line isn't sort of overwhelmingly steep, of course, these are, are quite small effects when you think about meaning in life and all of the things we're hearing about uh, in these next few days. It's a very sort of complicated assessment. And there's a, a great deal of trait stability in meaning in life. Um, and so we would expect these momentary uh, movements to be quite small. And that is what we see. However, the implications of this finding for the way we think about meaning in life, I argue, are important. These findings, that coherence manipulations uh, of meaning in life and seeing these relationships between routines and, in, and uh, meaning in life, suggest something about this experience. Primarily that not all meaning needs to be actively created through effort. Some meaning is. We have a lot of good work showing how people reinstate meaning when it's threatened with trauma or things like that. But this work adds the caveat that not all meaning is demanding of this effort. Sometimes this sense of personal meaning is simply extracted automatically from a world and from experiences that just sort of already make sense. And so I've argued for these feelings of meaning as representative of these sort of intuitive feelings 
of rightness that can ebb and flow from moment to moment, depending on whether we feel, depending on in part, whether we feel that our experiences are making sense to us. I've argued that this is sort of the default state, that we walk around in our daily lives and they're typically going quite well as planned and we have this sort of baseline sense that our lives are meaningful. And I have other work showing that most people rate their lives as, most, as, as quite meaningful in most circumstances. And it's that we don't have to really think about meaning or engage in these meaning-making efforts until we're confronted with a situation that disrupts our default experience of feeling like our lives are already quite meaningful. So an implication of these findings for the way we think about meaning in life has to do with how we think about the function of this experience. Why do we have feelings of personal meaning? And coherence might provide a clue. Because detection of reliable connections in our environments is a survival relevant process for all species. We navigate the world better when we can detect patterns, associations, and so on. To understand the underlying coherence of our world is an adaptive process. And so this might provide a clue to why meaning in life is such a beneficial experience. Others have said, uh, sort of provided a list of the beneficial outcomes that come, uh, that are related from experiencing life as meaningful, things like better health, longevity, better relationships, and so on and so on and so on. But by examining the way that our feelings of meaning might connect us to the world provides us with a clue to why meaning in life might be a beneficial experience. So in formulating this functional approach to meaning in life, I drew on uh, a psychological theory uh, from Norbert Schwartz and Jerry Klor, uh, this feeling as information approach. So the feelings of information approach suggests that our feelings are adaptive because they provide us with information about the world, and then we can use that information to operate in that world in the way that's sort of the most fitting for the current context that you're in. So I applied this to feelings of meaning, suggesting that our feelings of meaning, when these ideas that sort of the world is making sense and my life is meaningful, bubble to the surface, also provide us with information, specifically with unique information about the degree to which the world around us is making sense, is going as we had planned, about the presence of regularities uh, in our environments. And then we can leverage this information provided by these feelings of meaning to navigate in the world that we now understand better because of the information that those feelings provided. And so it directs our processing in situationally adaptive ways, which might explain why meaning is related to all sorts of these positive outcomes. So where does this leave us? I've sort of just argued that meaning can be found in these really mundane ways, these really sort of unsatisfying experiences of simply engaging in a world that makes sense and engaging in routine behaviors. But I'm going to argue that I haven't wrecked meaning here. The rest of this conference is still uh, on. Just because something is easy to attain doesn't cheapen this experience in any way. It doesn't make it any less valuable. Instead, by examining the way that our feelings of meaning connect us to the external world, I would argue the opposite, that by situating meaning in this context actually acknowledges the role that meaning plays in adaptation. And instead of cheapening it, it actually highlights the importance of these feelings and highlights the importance for meaningful lives. So I guess my takeaway argument to leave you before the Q&A session is to have you consider how much we can learn about meaning in life from taking seriously these experiences of real life people in just ordinary everyday situations, experiencing meaning in their ordinary lives. 
Thank you.